Good morning. Happy Resurrection Day. Glory to God. This is Gospel of Deliverance. I'm Rev. Steve Williams. Very happy to have you with me today, this very special day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare our hearts to receive of today's message. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its perfection. We thank you, Lord God, that uh, you um, are not just in our lives to make things better, but you are in our lives to change us dramatically. And then there will come a day, just as Jesus rose from the grave, that we too shall rise in resurrection. Lord God, we thank you for it, and we thank you that this message can be ours today, that we can truly partake of it. Anoint our minds and our hearts, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Glory to God. Today's topic is the Passover napkin. The Passover napkin. Let's go to John chapter 20 and verse 7. John chapter 20 and verse 7. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Wrapped meaning folded or twisted together. This napkin, better put handkerchief, for that's really what it was. Um, Alexander McLaren wrote of this, and, and this is this entire idea of this napkin being folded holds great information, holds great information for you and for me. Reverend McLaren said, observe too the further witness of the folded grave clothes. John from outside had not seen the napkin lying carefully rolled up apart from the other clothes. It was probably laid in a part of the tomb invisible from without. But the careful disposal of these came to him when he saw them with a great flash of illumination. There had been no hurried removal. Here had been no hostile hands, or there would not have been this deliberation, nor friendly hands, or there would not have been such dishonor to the sacred dead as to carry away the body nude. What did it mean? Could he himself have done for himself what he had bade them do for Lazarus? Could he have laid aside the garments of the grave as needing them no more? They had taken them away. What if it were not they, but he? No trace of hurry or struggle was there. He did not go out with haste, nor go by flight, but calmly, deliberately, in the majesty of his lordship over death. He rose from his slumber and left order in the land of confusion. He left order in the land of confusion. Friends, we live in the land of confusion today. And God um, provides for us the only way to have peace. He offers peace and it comes from his deliberation, his planning. John Gill said of this very same verse, this head binder or napkin was not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself and was plainly the effect of thought, care, and composure and clearly showed that the body was not taken away in a hurry or by thieves since everything lay in such order and decency and which was done either by our Lord himself or by the angels. And however it was accomplished, it was thought out and it was planned. And more than likely it had been planned since all eternity past. Since God really doesn't do anything on the spur of the moment. Everything is orderly with Christ, Yeshua. Nothing on the spur of the moment, but it's fully planned to the very smallest of details. The very smallest. M. R. Vincent's word studies in the New Testament uh, calls this folded napkin rolled up. The orderly arrangement of everything in the tomb, he said, 
marks the absence of haste and precipitation in the awakening and rising from the dead. When we look at the resurrection, often we get caught up in the big picture. The big picture of Jesus being raised from the dead and being gone. But so much is written in these few words and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. That is so important. Because it means that our lives that are planned out by God are not done in haste. That everything is carefully prepared. Thank you, Lord Jesus. A.T. Robertson's word pictures in the New Testament said it was arranged in an orderly fashion. There was no haste. You can't arrange things in haste. Christ arranges everything so far in advance that we should never have a worry nor a concern. We spend so much of our lives toiling and worrying about things in this life, not understanding that the one that took time to fold the binding that was over his face, that was over his head, and laid out the clothes properly, and here we see this Napkin, this handkerchief put away further into the tomb and carefully folded. This is our master. And he does nothing. He does nothing with haste. Everything is full and completely planned for our blessing. Listen to this from Pulpit Commentary. By itself... The old adverb, apart, had been folded up or wrapped together. It was clear then that the body had not been carried away for another burial, nor had it been hastily removed, seeing that there were signs of deliberation, choice, and care. All that was suggested by this wonderful appearance of the grave, all that it means to us, we cannot fathom. The new life has raiment of its own belonging to a higher region of existence woven in spiritual looms. Yet the hands that unwound these bandages and headcloth and laid them as Peter and John saw them were capable of physical exertions and activity. What dogmatic hints are involved in this recital. He is a living person, not an abstract principle or vague force. There are evident proofs that however great the change which had passed over him, the living one, was the same man that he had ever been. The very same God that he had been from all eternity past, so was he now. Fully planning. Fully in control, with no concern of what man could do or attempt to do. He was ready. And so he is ready for us. Glory to God. I said He is ready for us and as He planned out the resurrection. So, so, He has planned out things for our lives, our salvation, our obedience, our ministry. He has planned it out. Friends, I've talked so much about the about the power of God and the ability to control things on this earth. And we've talked a lot about Cyrus in the past six months to a year. I've mentioned him many times as fighting the will of God, but yet God had control. And Cyrus did as God bid him to do. We need to look at the Word of God and understand that things do not happen by accident. Now listen to this. Remember that the Word of God in the first covenant, what we call the Old Testament, said that there would be a child born in Bethlehem. Yet, his natural father, Joseph, and his mother Mary, this Savior, Jesus Christ. His parents were from Nazareth as far as 
where their living quarters were. But Bethlehem was where uh, their city of heritage, that was their place of heritage, their families coming from there. Now here's what's marvelous, think about it. Thousands of miles away, Augustus Caesar says, I want a census. I want a census of all of Judea. Which means that Joseph and Mary must go to Bethlehem. And Jesus is born there, just as the Scripture would say. Just as the Scripture said, God had it done. And He moved a man thousands of miles away with no heart for him, a complete heathen and pagan, believing himself to be a god. And God told him what to do. Even God. I said, God tells people what to do. Even the ruler of a great nation. Don't worry about God being in control. He controlled it to the point and gave prophecy its fulfillment by controlling people and controlling elements. If he can do that, and he does and has, he does it for you and me. Thank you, Lord. He is risen. And we too shall be risen. Glory to God. Luke chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. Luke chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. Today is about being loosed. Today is about being loosed. Luke chapter 13, 15 and 16. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Glory to God. Hallelujah. To be loosed. Friends, no differently than we read of Lazarus being loosed from his grave clothes. So too this woman was loosed, so too we shall be loosed from this body. Glory to God. We will be loosed. F.B. Meyer said this about these verses. A faith which made her especially susceptible to the healing word of Christ. Infirmity of any kind should drive us to the house of God. We shall meet Jesus there. When he says loosed, All the powers of hell cannot bind us down. He breaks the power of canceled sin. Woo, glory. Hallelujah. Think about this. Jesus has the genuine cancel culture. Everybody's trying to cancel one another out in these days trying to uh, shut people down, well, let me tell you what. Jesus can shut sin down. I said He can shut sin down and give us freedom, give us peace, all in preparation for that glorious resurrection day for me and for you. That we will be loosed from this place that we will be truly free. Jesus has the genuine cancel culture because He's canceling something that matters. He's canceling sin. Glory to God. Hell cannot bind us anymore once born again. Sin cannot lead us astray and bind us up into torment ever again because Jesus has canceled our sin. Hallelujah. Let's go to Psalm 116 and 16. Psalm 116 and verse 16. O Lord, 
Truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant, and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. Thou hast loosed my bonds. Friends, we're free today. Our bondage is over with. Jesus is risen from the dead. And He is that first example of resurrection. That first example of a heavenly body. The first example and the example that we desire to follow. Everything we want, all of our hope, all of our desires are wrapped up in resurrection. Right here in this resurrection day, this day, above all, directs us to heaven, directs us to the rapture. Glory to God. C.H. Spurgeon wrote of this verse, 116 and 16, The man of God, in paying his vows, rededicates himself unto God. The offering which he brings is himself. As he cries, O Lord, truly I am thy servant. Rightfully, really, heartily, constantly, I owe that I am thine, for thou hast delivered and redeemed me. I am thy servant and the son of thy handmaid, a servant born in thy house, born of a servant, and so born a servant, and therefore doubly thine. My mother was thine handmaid, and I, her son, confess that I am altogether thine by claims, arising out of my birth. O oh, that children of godly parents would thus judge, said C. H. Spurgeon. But alas, there are many who are the sons of the Lord's handmaids, but they are not themselves His servants. They give sad proof that grace does not run in the blood. Oh, how we wish it did. How we wish that that grace was birthed in us from our parents. But it is not. We must find that grace ourselves. We must find that salvation ourselves. We must proclaim that we are a servant of the Almighty God. And that we will not let go of the God of Abraham. The God of Isaac and Jacob. We will not let go, but we will serve Him. And fully, Spurgeon continues, David's mother was evidently a gracious woman and she is glad to remember that fact. And he is glad to remember that fact. And to see it in a fresh obligation to devote himself to God. Thou hast loosed my bonds. Freedom! from bondage binds me to thy service. He is loosed from the bonds of sin, death, hell, and should rejoice to wear the easy yoke of the great deliverer. The easy yoke of the great deliverer, Yahshua. And Spurgeon finishes out, Note how the sweet singer delights to dwell upon his belonging to the Lord. It is evidently his glory, a thing of which he is proud, a matter which causes him intense intense satisfaction. Verily, it ought to create rapture in our souls if we are able to call Jesus Master and are acknowledged by Him as His servants. Friend, it is time to get excited because we're celebrating Resurrection Day and we are celebrating the very fact of the planning, the very planning of our resurrection, our rapture, glory to God, and all of it will unfold so easily, just as that napkin was folded, everything else will work for us, because God has planned it out from all eternity past, I said He's planned it out from all eternity past, and and has shown us the way, He has shown us exactly what's going to happen. That's the beautiful part of it. What we see with Christ at that tomb is what's going to happen to you and what's going to happen to me. We're going to go out, yes, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, but friends, it's not in haste, 
because of concern. It's just the way that Christ works. And everything planned out. Every last iota prepared for from all eternity past. John 11, 44. John 11 and 44. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin for wiping sweat, cleaning the nose, or swathing the head of a corpse. That's what this handkerchief was for. Jesus saith unto him, Loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. When that last trump is sound, when the dead in Christ shall rise and all of those that are living shall follow in an atomic second with them, we truly shall be loosed. Just as Jesus said, let Lazarus go, he says to the world, he says to our bodies, he says to Satan, let them go. They're mine. I'm taking them home. B.W. Johnson wrote about this verse. The earth had never beheld a more wonderful or startling sight. At once the sleeper arose, came forth, bound with his grave clothes, with the napkin still upon his face that had been bound under his jaw to keep it from falling. The lookers-on, astonished, dazed, were only recalled to themselves when the Lord bade them, loose him and let him go. They were so astonished at what they saw, they were just standing there, immobile. Loose him and let him go. He spoke as the divine word, and death obeyed as he cried to Lazarus, Come forth. So shall he speak with the voice of an archangel to all that are in their graves, and they shall come forth and live. Friends, this is the day we're waiting for. Resurrection Day. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want to tell you what. Everything is planned out by God. And I have no doubt, as of course the days ran sunset to sunset, not morning to morning like we look at it. I have no doubt in my mind, since we know that as they approached the grave, Early on that Lord's Day, Sunday morning, at about 3 o'clock in the morning, he was already gone. I don't believe he spent any more minutes or one moment more than when that sun went down on Saturday evening. Why? Because it was all planned. He fulfilled his time, and it was over. And he was gone. Glory to God. Friends, not one second shall delay us. Not even an atomic second will delay us. Boom! We're loosed. Everyone in every grave, regardless of condition, regardless of how they died, regardless of how their body was treated afterward, they shall be loosed and fully formed in a spiritual body, looking as they looked before, perfected for all eternity. And friends, all of us that are here and still alive, we too shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's why I said I don't believe Christ stayed one moment longer than when that sun went down in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. His resurrection didn't take seconds or minutes or hours for his body to come to life. Instantaneously, he was resurrected. Just as he called forth, Lazarus, come forth. The only time spent was for Lazarus to hobble or to be drawn out of that grave. Friends, God has got a plan for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. 
2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened not for that we would be unclothed, but be clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up by life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of his Spirit. Listen to that. God hath wrought us for the self same thing is God. He that is wrought us for the self same thing is God. What self same thing? That mortality will be swallowed up by life, life eternal. That is why He's wrought us, He's remade us. We're born again for the purpose. That's the purpose of having eternal life. Glory to God. So, all that we speak, all that we act out, every deed, everything is working toward that final goal, friend, of being resurrected. Being changed from this vile existence to the marvelous, wonderful, grace-filled eternity with Christ Jesus. That is what we have to look for. All these scriptures and more are about building our faith regarding that great and mighty day of the resurrection of the dead and the catching away of the living. This is our hope. All our faith is wrapped up in those burial clothes that were found and especially that Passover napkin that handkerchief that was so neatly folded, not in haste, but folded deliberately with all power. And he had no concern for what man could do. Don't worry about what man can do. Let us not be concerned about what the world can do or cannot do or will do or won't do. Let us not be worried about what they're going to try to require us to do because, friends, one day... The trump will sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and those living shall be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, and we will put on immortality over mortality. Glory to the Holy Lord of heaven. Glory to the Creator of the universe, Jehovah Jireh, our true provider, because He provides everything. He calls for us to do something. Listen to this. He calls for us to do something and He makes the way for it to be done. He's always done it. Listen to that. Where does it even come from? Abraham was called to make a sacrifice. There was none except Isaac his son. He laid him upon the altar. His son was not three or four or five or six or eight or nine or ten, but was of age. He laid down willing. The sacrifice was willing to lay down upon that altar. As he asked, where's the sacrifice? God will provide, son. God will provide. And then, stirring, a rushing, a ram caught in the thicket. God providing. Friends, God has provided the sacrifice. He always is Jehovah Jireh. He calls us to do something and He provides the means for us to do it. We're not on our own. He's not given us too much to do because He's the one that provides the means, the know-how, the strength, Glory to our most holy Lord and Savior, Yeshua. No one, no one 
ever has cared for me like Jesus. No one. All my friends, everything, all hope, all desires are wrapped up in Him. So He prepares us today. He's preparing us today for that soon coming glorious day when we too will be loosed once and for all. Oh, we've been loosed and sin has been canceled. But we're going to see a loosening that we didn't even realize was possible. We will be loosed once and for all and all of what's happened will be lost in memory. It will be accounted it will be accounted as nothing for what we gain. This is resurrection day. This is the Lord's day. And I am happy and blessed to celebrate Resurrection Sunday because it is drawing my attention not just to His passing and resurrection, it draws my attention to my own. His promise to me, His promise to you, that you too will be resurrected. And God has done it. God Himself wrought us he has borne us again. He has crafted us, created us fresh and new. He has made us over as the master potter. He has made over his clay for the purpose of eternal life. And you, you have accepted Christ as your Savior. The smartest thing you'll ever do, the smartest thing you've ever done is saying, I repent of all my sin. I feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost. If you've not done so, if you, if you have not accepted Christ, if you have not felt the convicting power of the Holy Ghost, I plead for you to beg God to convict you of sin. Pour yourself out to Him that you too, you too, will be born again and face Resurrection Day with a glad heart. Friends, what a day this is. Resurrection Sunday, the Lord's Day. God's promise to you and to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer that we're just going to have a marvelous day in Him and that we're going to spread the word like never before that you don't want to miss out on that resurrection day. Father, anoint us for the purpose of testifying and spreading your word and being happy, showing our joy at the advent of resurrection that we are going to be and we know that we're going to be because we have the seal of the Spirit. We've been given that promise of resurrection. Glory to you, Lord. Anoint us for that purpose. Empower us for that purpose. To share. Because time is short. We know it is. Give us that anointing. And let us rejoice today. This resurrection Sunday. Your day, my Lord. My Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, and I just pray that you have a great day in God. Goodbye.